I am really excited about this uh, panel discussion that we have now. Uh, it's always a thrill to have many different intellects uh, come up and talk about a subject. Um, and again, as Leah talked about in the beginning, uh, for us, including a discussion of art of the Meskwaki Nation was really important to uh, both the exhibition, but also this symposium and what we wanted to talk about. So. Uh, please help me and welcome me. We have on the far end here Gaylord Torrance from the Nelson Atkins uh, Museum of Art in Kansas City. He's their uh, curator of the Native American collection there. We have Jonathan Buffalo, who's here from uh, the Meskwaki uh, Preserva uh, Cultural Center, and he's their director of preservation. Next to him, we have Suzanne Wanati Buffalo. Um, she helped to create a history of the Meskwaki with, along with Jerome Thompson and um, Jonathan. And so we're ha happy to have her here. And then on the end, our moderator for today is Dr. Sebastian Braun, and he is the director of Native American Studies here at ISU. So please give them a warm welcome. And thank you. All right, I think I, I should start, right? Yeah, okay, <laughs> since I'm the moderator, okay. <laughs> so, um, I guess you were all just introduced, so maybe I'll just jump in with the questions. Is that okay? All right, um, and what I was wondering is, uh, we heard this morning from uh, the WPA guide on Iowa, there was not that much art in Iowa, and then we heard Jeff Bremer talk about, um, a little bit about uh, art to, um, in terms of uh, who is an artist and and what what is art actually, and Jonathan just told me that he he you know as a hobby carves pipes, but he used to do it as as a, like his pr profession really. And so I was wondering if we maybe could start out with asking you how what do you see as art and and when is something art and when is an artifact and and is it is it important to make that difference for you especially geared towards uh, native art who wants to go first anybody who wants <laughs> i'll go first well my name is Suzanne Buffalo um my maiden name is Wanity my grandmother is Adeline Wanity and I was very happy to see in the room over here on the other side when we came around the corner that one of my grandmother's yarn belts is there. You can spy her yarn belts. I can identify them from across the room, even if I've never seen them before. They're very distinctive. So thank you for having a little part of my grandmother here today. Really, really made my day. Um, we have a complex relationship with our world. Our world is always changing, and much of the art that we make, um, what's being reflected is the world that we live in during that time. So for example, um, you'll see on the Antiques Roadshow, sometimes there'll be pieces that come up from the early 1800s. There'll be extraordinary um, beadwork, quill work, leather work, um, and it'll go for tens of thousands. Uh, there was one Kiowa shirt, I think, that went for about $100,000 um, in the, these big auction houses. So I think part of what Sebastian is referring to is you get into these areas where you're talking about Native American art and you're saying, is that art? Is that an artifact? Uh, does it make a difference? Does it matter? So one of the things to keep in mind is um, during some periods in the United States, there were more resources available. For example, um, whaling was being done. Uh, uh, Native Amer Americans up in Alaska did a lot of carving on um, using materials that really aren't available now because those animals are extinct um, or they their numbers dramatically dropped or the Native peoples were impacted by um, incoming neighbors and policies that remove them from those natural resources. Uh, the same could be said for those items you see on um, the Antiques Roadshow, where we get people to come to our reservation, to our settlement, every time and they go, don't you guys make that stuff anymore? Gosh, it's too bad, you've lost that. You're not real Indians and you guys aren't really traditional anymore, are you? 
And we get that a lot because they're very disappointed. They want to see the things in the museums. They want us to see us walking around wearing them. They want us to see them, us making them. They want us to be reenactors as opposed to living Indians. So the question that you pose is very good because we get that a lot. We, we, when I say our worlds are very complex, um, yes, we have people who are artists. Yes, we have, um, we have a lot of um, appreciation for beauty. Uh, we have a lot of basic needs for things that we can't buy on a mass market. Uh, buffalo mat needle doesn't come up much in Walmart, so we usually have to make those ourselves. And um, so there are a lot of things that we do make that are utilitarian. There are things that we make to bury with our dead. There are things that we can't make anymore, not because we, we've moved on and it was a fad and everything. Um, I was so glad to hear, where's our gentleman who spoke this morning? Is he still here? Um, I really appreciated um, the talk this morning about the history of Iowa because one of the things about the Antiques Roadshow phenomenon that we call it with all of these amazing pieces uh, that, that people bring in to have valued, um, it wasn't just the buffalo that went extinct. He did a very good job, um, our speaker this morning, explaining it was the deer, it was the elk. It wasn't just the food part that went away. It was, it was the byproducts for those. So part of the reason why a lot of tribes moved their materials or stopped making things was, was quite bluntly, there wasn't anything left. There was nothing here. Iowa did go through a very hard time. He did not underestimate that. I think, um, I think it was actually a little bit more worse than the situation he described. And we know that because people came to us to help them um, to keep from starving to death. And those were our neighbors, our, not, not Indians. Those were our, our new white immigrants. There wasn't doctors, there wasn't um, nurses. We were the midwives to many of the new female, uh, female members who'd moved in to Iowa. Um, so we do know how hard Iowans had it. And w the first thing we tell everybody is, you can't understand Iowa history, uh, Meskwaki history, unless you understand Iowa history. And Iowa, it takes a very independent, strong person to live in Iowa, it always has. And this land is basically trying to kill you for most of the year. And, um, but it's okay, it's all right, we'll make it work. Um, so we're, we believe that much of what we create is a reflection of the world we live in at that time. There are things that we still make. They're a little bit different. Maybe the natural resources aren't there anymore. Um, maybe the need for it has, has gone away. Um, I'm not gonna talk forever, but for example, can you hold this, my dear? I'm wearing a necklace today that is just, um, I could wear it at a ceremony, I could wear it at, um, just because I wanna look nice, because it's a, it's a thing that we're attracted to the color, the design. It has uh, ribbons down the back, and it's called a drop. Um, one of the functions of that and I have a, if you don't mind, let me grab a different one. When we talk about what is art, I'd like to show you a piece, pardon me. So here's a more elaborate version of what I have on. It's got a necklace down the front. This is the drop that handles, hangs in the back. There's little bells, makes a little noise. This is really good for dancing feel really pretty when I got this on. Um, you get tangled up a lot in these. You have to do a lot of standing. So there's some logistical concerns for this. However, the function of this is not just art. There's a social function to this piece in the back. And on the Antiques Roadshow, they won't tell you what this piece in the back is for. And you think, okay, now why don't American women have something down the back? Why, how come we're only decorating the front? Well, we like to decorate the back. This is um, an indication of whether a woman is married or single. We didn't have wedding rings. Oh, 
I do, I just didn't put mine on today. Um, but back then, the function of this piece in the back was to communicate and inform the people around you in a social setting. Um, this doesn't drag the ground. If I was single, there would be pieces that hang down further than here that would lightly touch the ground when I walk. So that would communicate to the people around that I was single. Okay, so is that art? I'm not sure. But we have that, and that's mainly for larger social events. We don't wa wear these around the house or anything. But if I was going out, if I had a, if I do have a daughter, and um, when she was single, I made sure that she had the one that appropriately reflected her marital status, not like I was looking to farm her out to anybody or anything. But I just wanted everybody to be working clear on the information. So um, this is an example of a modern piece that wouldn't look like this 400 years ago. But this is a very modern piece. This was probably made about 15 years ago, I would think, or something like that. But it's very similar in function. Is it art? I'm not sure because it's very um, utilitarian. Some, many of the pieces that we make communicate something about us or our world. And I think you would agree, a lot of artists would agree, that's part of what they're doing. They're communicating something about their world. So um, many things that we make are, are made specifically to bury with people. It's meant for the afterlife. When we would go into museums before the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, some of the things that you would see in a museum. Um, when bodies were excavated from a site, um, many times the clothing and the items that was buried with that person was separated from the body. And that was what, in some cases, ended up at museums. So Native Americans do have a really conflicted, what the question he's asking, asking is a very legitimate and still very real question for a lot of people, a lot of Native American people. When we go into a museum, we ask, how did you get that? Where did it come from? Just because you are now the staff to this museum and you say, well, it wasn't me. I'm not the one who dug, it up, dug up the person. I'm not the one who did that. And now we're just going to call it art. Um, there's reasons why there's laws that protect um, grave desecrations. Um, interestingly enough, it has also opened the door. Those very laws that the museums and the institutions feared would empty out their museums, it brought rise to opportunities to talk with Native Americans to create new pieces of art to use in place of that that actually had more meaning. Um, like I said, if you saw this, you would go, oh, what a great necklace. I wonder what that thing in the back is for. Without me to explain that, would a museum curator know what that's for? And so there's a value in any art piece. You have art installations. You have the artists come, and they talk about their pieces. Um, I think that that's, it's imperative that we keep Native Americans very involved in any art discussions because there's a lot that can, that can be added in value plus the perspective of the Native American, maybe to that Native American, that's not a, that's not a piece of art that should be buried with that person. You know, that's, that's, a, that's something that should be considered as well. And uh, a lot of Native Americans in their tribal historical preservation offices deal with this very much to this day. So it's a good question. Got my, got my own? Can you hear me? Well, well, the way I would answer is it's anything we make is an artifact, but every artifact is artistic. And uh, in my job, I deal with museums and artifacts. Nowadays, since the law, museums have been kind of changing their minds of their artifacts. Now every museum wants to make them art, art pieces. So they all 
so now they're desperately looking for who um, who made it so they can make a little elk to artists so but the way i've seen i've seen it is like have you heard of the six blind men describing an elephant just put it six blind museums describing artifacts an art museum will describe their collection in in terms of art another museum will describe them in terms of just um, stuff you know each each one has a different they see it different and each one thinks they're right just like I I've been repatriating bear claw necklaces and one museum kept saying to me that it was just clothing every Meskwaki man had was walking around with bear claws in the 1830s you know if I was a man in the 1830s I would say wife I'm going to see the trader give me my bear claw necklace that's you know but only only certain men had bear claw necklaces but that's how they were arguing with me and I'm going to pretty soon repatriate one from an art museum and I bet they're going to <laughs> argue with me that it's a <laughs> sorry sorry that it's an art object so that's how that's how I would describe <laughs> and uh, that's how I would describe yes they are artifacts but every artifact is artistic where we can't it's just like we're very spiritual we can't do anything without being spiritual even breathing but we're not very religious if you understand the meaning you know we look we do a lot of religious stuff but everything is spiritual to us but not everything is sacred you know because that's another thing but everything we do is artistic That's it. <laughs> oh. um, well, I want to pick up on just a couple of things that Suzanne and Jonathan mentioned. And Sebastian, first of all, as you can see already, the question of what is art and what is artifact is intensely complicated. And it's a discussion that has been going on for a long time. And I, I'd mention, I'd like to begin by mentioning just two things. First of all, <clears throat> Art museums didn't begin acquiring, most art museums did not begin acquiring Native American objects. They simply did not recognize it as, as something of artistic merit. The beginnings were all natural history museums, some historical museums. They were collecting objects from what they assumed was going to be a disappearing body of our, our population that everyone was going to be acculturated, that Native American societies would no longer exist, and um, there was an effort to acquire everything that they possibly could as a record of the past. And in that way, they tended to, I think in the minds of many mainstream Americans, lock Native Americans in a certain section of the past. And that, thankfully, has changed dramatically um, beginning in the 20th century and certainly in the last 30 years. The other thing that always comes to mind, and it, it almost always comes up somewhere, is someone, I, I don't know who said it originally, but they made the point that Native Americans had no word for art in their language. No, no word for artist. And from that, 
with logic I don't understand, was formed the deduction that there was no critical basis for what was produced. And of course, that's not right. There are, you know, I mean, going back to pre-encounter times, remarkable artistic traditions where individuals of exceptional intelligence, spirituality, sensitivity, skill, produced objects that really embodied the heart of the culture <clears throat> and the heart of communities. And that's a distinction that I would like to make as well, is that looking at what I, what I know of 19th century Meskwaki art and earlier, this was all art that was produced, artifacts produced, objects produced for use within the community. And the, the values, I would think, the beliefs, uh, social structure, whether or not someone is married or single, all of these things were communicated through artistic forms. And so it was the art that really, I think it was Lloyd Kibanu who said that, um, you know, a culture reveals itself most, native culture reveals itself most through its art, through what it produces. So, the, <clears throat> and that brings us to, I think, the quality or the issue of quality in art. Is everything equal? And I had a conversation yesterday where I evoked a conversation that I had with your grandmother 35 years ago. And I, I went to see her to talk about her ribbon applique because everyone on the settlement um, spoke of her work in such high regard. And we had a remarkable conversation, uh, I still recall, about what is it, when, when is a piece of ribbon applique a work of art? And when is it not? And I won't tell you what she said, because it's, uh, it's uh, um, the conversation moved into, I will say, formal issues, issues of color and design, uh, all the things that a ribbon applique maker would take into consideration in producing something. But also, she talked about a skirt that she was working on. She described it as saying that it, it honors the night. And my colleague at the time said, oh, you know, so this, this skirt symbolizes the night. And she corrected him, and she said, no, it honors the night. And in that, I think what she was trying to communicate to us who were looking at this, you know, from Western, a Western sensibility, was that, that this design, these colors, this object, and the fact that it would be worn in a ceremony, all of that fully imbued this piece with a belief system that would be recognized within the community and also held by her as an individual maker. So it's, and I'll, I'll stop there. I think it's a, uh, this question, what is art, what is artifact, should it be in a museum, should it not? Um, I think these are all questions that certainly museum people are grappling with today from a variety of perspectives. I, I just want to affirm what Suzanne said that NAGPRA, which began I think in 92, was it? Um, the great thing about NAGPRA, besides the restitution of all of the human remains and burial objects, was that it started a conversation between museums and native peoples. And, and what those of us that work in the museum world, um, <clears throat> when one is, is talking with native peoples with traditional knowledge, we find that those individuals bring an entire, they, they, another level, another layer or layers of meaning to these objects. And so it's been a very exciting time the last 20, 30 years. I should mention that in, I guess, 
It's 30 years ago, um, this fall, that I curated an exhibition on the art of the Meskwaki that spanned the years 1780 to 1980. Jonathan was one of our keynote speakers. He was a kid. <laughs> I could tell you stories. And um, uh, it was an extraordinary experience to work within that community, which I did for about 10 years. Because up to that time, all of my work had been done in museum storages, in libraries, uh, talking to other non-Indian scholars. Um, it was the immersion into the community that really forced me to recalibrate everything that I had thought and assumed simply by looking at historical works. Because what I saw within the Meskwaki community was an incredible continuum from the earliest things that we, we know that were produced by Meskwaki or Sauk people into the present day. It didn't just go from something that was old into something that was contemporary. In many forms, it never stopped. Thank you so much. Um, so, I'm going to throw this away. Um, <laughs> so, a lot of you spoke about several things that I want to, that I w would like you to expand on maybe in our conversation, but um, some of them are ownership and, and things, things like that. Um, but one of the things that, that struck me was the meaning part, right? Art is art because we say it's art. <laughs> and, and depending on what it means to us. And uh, Suzanne, you, when you walked through the, sorry, when you walked through the exhibition before, right, um, and actually when you did the exhibition behind the exhibition, which is the recent acquisitions in ceramics, I think the two exhibitions really talk to each other. I don't know if that's planned or, but I think they really talk to each other. And so Suzanne talked to me about it <laughs> because she saw this one pot that looks like a swan. And, um, and, and I saw, you know, there's another pot that has a buffalo on it and, and um, some other things on it that, that also spoke to me, like in, in terms of like what is in, the, in, in these rooms and what is in that room. But Suzanne uh, was nice enough to explain to me how she sees that pot and, and you know, what, what the swan means to her and how many people don't realize what swans mean in the Mixwaki culture. And I think the same is true for, you know, bear necklaces, as Jonathan mentioned, right, and other things. So my, my question is really, how can you curate something or how can you exhibit something without the loss of this meaning when you have to translate, or do you have to translate the meaning that something holds, for example, in Mixwaki art for a general public that is not Mixwaki and 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 if so, like, how can you attempt? How do you attempt to do that? Well, is this on? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in our little museum back home, there's there's uh, two clear boxes, and one box <coughs> holds a uh, a drumstick, a regular powwow drumstick and then another on the other side is uh, is another drumstick but it's not called a drumstick it's it's wood and it's got a little knob on it and and we use those to sing in our clan ceremonies we use a different type of drum and it's just one drummer and those two are on end. And to me, what I was showing is we're both religious and we're both secular. This is secular part of our life. This is our religious part. But there's no explanation in it. I don't have to go stand there and explain these two meanings. I just let whoever comes in <coughs> kind of figure it out themselves. And there's another part where we do that, is we have a, 
a big pipe. And on this corner is a war club, a real war club, not a powwow war club. This is the real thing. This thing has killed people. <coughs> and we made it. Who was the guy that designed? We hired somebody from Minnesota to mount him. <coughs> and on the pipe, us Meskwakis, we use pipe for ceremonies. But we have no problem of connecting the pipe to the to the stem to display it. But through through the powwow tent, we used to do that. But some tribes hate that. And they would complain, who did this? You know, who did this? These aren't supposed to. So we started taking them apart. So in our display of the pipe is the pipe stem comes pretty close to the pipe, but it doesn't touch it, you know, for. And then the pipe, the war club, we wanted it to stand up, but it's heavy. And the guy who was making it couldn't figure out how to stand it up at an angle without it falling down. But he did it. So it's standing up. So when you're looking at it, it's coming down at you. You know, that's how you would see it. It's coming down at you. And that symbolizes. We want peace. Every nation wants peace. But you have to be prepared for war. Just like with us Meskwakis. We can be very good or we can be very bad. You know, because that's how we're made. Anyway, that's, I think that's, I think I answered. That's <laughs> my part. <laughs> Um, and that's some things that some museums um, and have an internal discussion with their staff figuring out how do we display this thing. Um, do we lay it down so it looks like it looks peaceful? And since it's our museum, that was one of the decisions we made as a tribe um, and he did in his department. The intent of a war club is to be, is to be used. We're not celebrating the death we're acknowledging we went through 400 years of everybody and their dog trying to kill us. And to it would be a dishonor to the Meskwakis who lived to try to be all nice about it now. Um, even when the weapons came with Western Europeans, you could still reload a war club quicker than you could a musket. So when it came to technology, superior technology on the battlefield, we, we maintained and valued not just the function and the form of the war clubs um, well into the early 1900s. The ones we make today, my grandson dances with one, it's not as, as mean looking as some of the other ones. It doesn't have any, a hole in there where lead has been poured in that we got from the mines of Dubuque because the, the lead used to make the war club heads even heavier. Um, we used to take spikes and put them in the ends of those. The war clubs during a time of war are, are there's like bombs. They're intense things. Is that art? And you'll see people who just collect war items from Native Americans. They only collect arrows. They only collect bows. They only collect war clubs. And they're saying that's art. Maybe. Is it? You know? Well, when we had ours, part of why we're displaying ours isn't to say, look, here's a piece of wood that killed someone. It helps to explain a very complicated history. And it helps explain who we are today without really explaining too much. And we don't have something on here that's, that, that says, look, this war club has killed people. We don't put that on there. The solution was to mount it up as if it was coming down on you. Then you get it. It doesn't matter if it's killed people or not. It doesn't matter if it was ever used or not. It doesn't really matter who made it. Isn't it amazing to have people 
that put this in their museum that needed this to stay alive. Ask me why I needed that to stay alive. Ask me how many people died to stay alive. That's what the war club is there for. That's the conversation. It's not how many people that piece of art killed. It's how on earth are you guys still here? It's an amazing story. We've, I was just, we were afraid, I was starting to forget, but it really is amazing. And, pardon me, um, one of the things that I like to say about the swan, in our culture, a swan is actually a warbird. And Western, what we found out from Western Europeans is the swan is a symbol of love, eternal. And um, have, you ever, have you ever met a swan? <laughs> Those are some tough birds. They'll come after you. You know, these are some tough, tough birds. Yeah, I think they do mate for life. I think that they're amazingly beautiful creatures, but you do not want to make one mad. And um, so we know about swans, but we, from our cultural perspective, that's something a veteran, someone who has been in war that needs to be honored. That's the, if I saw that bowl in the other room, that's the first thing I thought of was, oh man, I'd probably give that to my dad. He would love that. Um, you can see certain people dance at the powwows. Um, uh, they might have swan feathers on, but you don't really know what kind of feathers those are. Uh, you might see someone have part of a swan in a cape, and you're thinking, that poor swan got killed to be have this Indian wear it. Well, you know, they all die eventually anyway, the swans do. So many times the, the, if you see a, someone that has that on, typically it's someone who's a veteran. Skunks, same way. Tough little creatures, um, hard to kill really hard to kill, that's another animal that's typically associated with veterans. Because and if they're dancing, usually veterans are one of the few that are allowed to have any skunk on their regalia or anything. Um, so it's things like that culturally. Swan dance. Um, swan dance is, um, looks great. Graceful movements of the swan. Um, that's a war dance. So we can't tell everybody that that comes, you know, and says, well, this is a war dance because then everybody's going to think that we're going to act up or something. But and it's not the whole war dance. It's just it's an exhibition part. We would never do anything religious in front of a bunch of people who it means nothing to. We don't think you should do that. If it's something so sacred, don't do it in front of 3000 people, you know, do that do that at, at home and in your ceremonies. So we would never put that on our audience or our visitors or our friends or our guests. We would never burden you with having to understand something that you don't have any reference points to, and it doesn't really matter if you know about it or not. It's okay for you to keep thinking of it as a beautiful swan. And a swan dance is something people see it. Our, our dance is beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful dance. But it's a war dance, honestly, is what it is. The original form. We have a club um, on display at the Nelson Atkins that I think is probably similar to the one that you have, a ball. It's a ball, it's a club that has a handle that then curves at the top and terminates in a ball. It's all carved from one piece of wood and we're dis we displayed ours like you displayed yours, um, at an angle, um, from a different point of reference altogether, we felt as a sculptural work, as a very, very sophisticated carving, um, it was most beautiful that way. Now, we, hmm, So it, there's always the question, as a museum curator, non-Indian, um, how do you display something? How do you display it in a way that honors the maker, that honors the culture, that honors the broad Native American culture of North America? 
And what do you say about it? How much do you say? You certainly don't say what you don't know. You try not to say what should not be revealed to the common public. And I would say that what we try to do is find, find a way to see, find a way for the viewer to see the complexity of this object and the layers of meaning that it possesses. Now the club in our museum is very abstract. When you first look at it, it's simply, it's a very, it's a complicated carving. The, the planar structure is, they're simply amazing transitions. It tapers very, very beautifully. Um, it's elegant. It looks, it looks both deadly and elegant at the same time. It's a remarkable combination. When you hold that club, it has the most amazing balance. If you hold it upright and just begin to tip it forward, it wants to fall. The person that made that club knew exactly what its purpose was. And in a close hand-to-hand -hand fight, it just, I mean, I, I used to say to my students, you pick a good war club up and you just want to hit someone. <laughs> I mean, it has, it has that perfect balance. So the man that carved this really understood the functional necessity of the piece that he was creating. But he also had an inherent sense of, um, I, I will say, sculptural power and beauty in the creation of this form. And what is most remarkable <coughs> is that even though it's highly abstracted, the handle becomes the head of an animal that holds the ball in its mouth. And so you're looking not only at a functional weapon, but also probably the embodiment of a spirit helper that was associated with that man. So again, going back to this issue of function and art, um, beginning with the Renaissance, you know, Euro-American culture basically created objects for contemplation, for observation. Um, special rooms were developed, collectors' cabinets developed, all of that. It was art that sort of held um, important ideas. And there was a separation of fine art and craft. Of course, that distinction has no meaning whatsoever in Native American art. It simply doesn't. Is that object, is the club, a piece of craftsmanship? Yes, it is. Is it incredible artistic vision? Yes, it is. And it also holds layers of meaning that would have been important to the owner. So it's, it's a religious object. Is it sacred? I, I loved what you said. Everything is spiritual by association. Some things have a sacred purpose, others do not. But that layer of meaning is there everywhere. And so in our display, uh, not only of the club, but the galleries in general, um, the lights are low. Objects have space. Um, the casework functions in a particular way. And all of it is, is dedicated, is directed towards presenting these works as religious art, because it fundamentally is. And although there are many things that are, it's, it's interesting, you know, working with, say, a book designer who really doesn't know much about native art, the first thing that they almost always want to do is focus on what's most decorative, you know, what's bright and colorful and all of that. And it really has a different kind of tone altogether. The more one knows, the deeper one gets into it. So going back to our label, um, we don't know the nation that this club came from. It dates from the 1700s. It came out of a collection in Germany originally. How it got there, who knows. Um, we feel that we can help a viewer understand this object to talk a little bit about its function, its functional capability, the expertise in carving, and the meaning of this animal holding the ball in its mouth. 
So it, it, gives, it gives someone who really doesn't know anything about native culture, native art, uh, native artifacts, um, a bit of an inroad into the layers of meaning that are embodied in this object. It isn't just a club. May I ask a question? Uh, you were talking about a means of entry into the meaning of the uh, club. Uh, is there any connection or a way from the presentation sword, which was so common after the Civil War, where uh, the people of a troop or what, whatever group would give their uh, commander a presentation sword, which could be a functional sword, which was highly decorated and was not intended to be used in battle, but had a social purpose as well as a military purpose. Uh, it seems to me that might be a path into the meaning of your artifacts or artwork, whatever you want to call them. Do you see any connection there? With, with the club that I'm describing or just generally? The presentation sword and the club that you're describing, which is uh, perhaps not intended to be functional any more than the presentation sword is intended to be used in battle, but still has that connection? I, the short answer would be no. I don't see a connection there. The club that we have was very much a functional club. It was intended as a weapon. Um, the, it wears its history. It has been carried to battle for a long time. There are scrapes that are dense. I mean, it's, it, it was a functional object. <laughs> Whether or not there were um, these kinds of objects made to give to other native people or non-Indians, I don't know. There's three types of clubs. There's the real one, you know. Then there's the the clubs that our grandson likes to dance with. They look real, but they're too light. They're made from a lighter wood. <coughs> then there's uh, smaller versions that are like in a baby cradle. If it's a boy, you you hang up a little club. You know, stuff like that. So those are the only the three kinds. Yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think, you know, like, like trade tomahawks, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think they were ever used. They were just given away. But that's, that's, that's not an that's not uh, that's not a invention fr fr from native societies. That's, that's like, and I think that the idea that you make something I mean, I might be wrong, but for me, like the idea that you make something simply and only for the purpose of of, of never using it, actually, in it, you know, f for what it's made for, <laughs> in a way, uh, and it, you know, it, I I don't know if that if, if that was a traditional, you know, historical. Uh, I, I I don't see the par I don't see a parallel to a presentation sword. Like, and you would use it because if you don't use it, I think then it doesn't have that. Power. If we gift something to someone or honor someone, we typically give them something of our own. So in theory, it never would be new. So if someone comes to my house and I'm grateful, I'm happy that they're there, I'll go into the other room and I'll get one of my necklaces and I would say, I want you to have this in honor of our friendship. I wouldn't go make them something new and give it to them because then it would just be something I'm buying for them. But in, instead I'm sharing it with them. It's moving through me to them. And some of this you, you hit on a actually a very important concept that tends to be difficult to explain to non native audiences stuff um 
it isn't important. Um, it moves through us sometimes. Sometimes something you might have it for a while and then it goes away. And it's, it's moving through you to someone else that really needs it. Whether it's a car or VCR. I used to come home on a Friday night and my VCR would be gone. That's when Hollywood movies and everything was there. It's like, shoot, I got like four videotapes that I can't watch because my VCR moved through to one of my sisters. <laughs> maybe it would come back and maybe it wouldn't. So um, when we die, everything we have goes back to the tribe. And on, even today, legally, on the Meskwaki Indian Settlement, we don't have probate because we don't own anything. We don't own our land. We don't own our, own our house. We can buy land as a tribe, but we don't own it individually. So while we're alive, that means we can't leverage it for equity and capital to start a business because it's all held in common. So when I die, he doesn't get to have a big yard sale with my best looking stuff and make money off of it. That goes... It, as soon as I die, that stuff passes through, um, not necessarily to my family. It goes back to the tribe. It is done with me, and it's moving on to whoever needs it. So if I were to give something that was very special and meaningful to somebody, it would never be anything new, ever. I don't know if that answers that. Oh, yeah. Explain that. One time, uh, what was her title? Shirley. 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 You know Shirley. Shirley <laughs> Shermer. She was Office of the State Archaeologist. Um, she was a, a facilitator, a contact person for um, reburial issues regarding Native American tribes in the state of Iowa. And... Um, can't remember what her official name was, but awesome, awesome woman. And uh, because she helped us bury many human remains, we used to call her Mamishi. And a Mamishi is a servant, ceremonial servant. So we would call her Mamishi. So when she retired, Suzanne and I gave her a spoon. A wooden spoon. Luke Capello made this. We asked him to make a wooden spoon. So we gave it to her and we told her, now you can keep this pure, put it on your shelf. And if you keep it that way, it's just a piece of wood in the shape of a spoon. You know, you can keep it that way. Or you can make it your spoon. And we said, and how you make it your spoon is this evening when you eat your supper, use the spoon. Then the spoon would have eaten what you ate. And it becomes part of you because you ate with it. That's what we do during ceremonies. We eat with them. And it's a conduit between our gods and us. So we told her, just eat with it, even if you do it once. Then it becomes your spoon. That becomes Shirley's spoon. But if you don't do that, then it's just sitting on your mantle, and it's a spoon that Jonathan and Suzanne gave you. That's what it's going to be. So that's what we did with Shirley. And she ate with the spoon. And she ate with it with that evening, and it became her spoon. You know, I, I think so. We're almost out of time, but <laughs> no, I, I want to get to this this one question of of uh, you know. As sometimes it's, it's often characterized as ownership of art, right, in museums. But what you just said about the spoon, right, is I think might be explaining this a little better. So if you have something that needs attention that is in in a collection in a museum somewhere else where it doesn't get that attention. Um, then it has to come back, right? So that somebody gets attention, gives attention to it, what is required, right? So could you talk a little bit about that um, in terms of ownership and then 
which is a very legal uh you know hard um idea of that you i can own something and and this other idea that well you might use something you might have it you might be taking care of it but you might not necessarily own it in that way and how that how that gets resolved today hopefully <laughs> in many cases gets resolved with, with museums and tribes well since 93 i've been battling museums over that of the idea of ownership. Even one museum <coughs> even asked me to prove, prove that you, your people had no idea of private property. So I did a little research. I found I couldn't say it. I couldn't get a tribal member to say it. So I had to get a lot of people to say it. Traders, Indian agents, wrestlers, and from the past, from the past you know. And uh, to say, these people don't believe in private property, you know, over and over again. These people don't believe in private property. Everybody owns everything, you know, even the earliest Frenchmen. <laughs> said, these people don't believe in private property. So I wrote up a report, sent it to them, and said, well, technically, we own everything, you know. And if you want to go legal, we could go legal, you know. Or you can just give me the darn bowl. Where's your bill of sale? You know, <laughs> and, and one thing I've been putting on them, Lately is uh, between before 1924, we couldn't make a legal deal. We couldn't make a legal contract. That's how come before 1924, we had Harlan helping us with the powwow. He was making the contracts. So technically, anything collected before 1924, you have to have a bill of sale. And you have to have the license to trade. So I've been telling museums, if it's before 1924, show me the license. Show me the license that you got from the agent to allow you to collect on the settlement. Because they're like uh, when I was collecting the bear claw necklaces, the w one museum and the story I heard was, this was the Fox Clan necklace. And the guy I knew back home, Luke said, actually that's, it was, it was known as the Pawashik necklace. You know, Bear Clan, Pawashik. And he said, well, actually it's not Pawashik's necklace. It's, it's from my family, the Capeo family which were the Fox clan seat on the council. He said, when my great-grandfather died, the widow married Jim Pawashik. And he started wearing it in pictures, powwow. Then he sold it to Iowa City, to that guy that gave it to the Iowa muse Museum. So I thought, oh, so by law, he didn't have a right to sell it. I got it, my card. So I went to the museum, and I told him we were going to repatriate it. And I told him, and to tell you, we're going to win. So we can make this easy or hard, but I'm going to re request it, and I'm going to win. I'm telling you right now. If we do it real easy, we shall give you a replica to replace what we take. So I make my formal request. In the meantime, they're fighting me. They start to fight. Then I make, where I make my report, and they can't fight it. So I got it. A week later, I got a letter from them and said, oh, what about the repub replica? <laughs> and I already had it. And I 
didn't even answer because I thought the deal was done. You know, it's done. You know, so so that's ownership. We, I can prove I could repatriate anything in a museum, but it would take time and to fight would take too long, too much money, and it's not worth trying to repatriate every little object. I got to go for the big ones. First, we had the second fox. We decided to go after human remains first. That was the most important thing, human remains. Then we dabbled in artifacts, you know. A couple bowls here. And one museum I tried, my, my great-grandfather sold it and I my argument was hey wait a minute everything in the household belonged to the woman did my great-grandfather get permission from my great-grandmother to sell the the bowl you know unless if you have a piece of paper saying mrs. push Toniqua sold this bowl my great-grandpa couldn't sell it but they just gave it to us. So, hey. Really quickly, I'd like to add, um, people like my grandmother, who felt strongly that um, Native American um, objects created that have been admired. When people come to the powwow, they admire how people look. They want to stand with their pictures taken next to us. And um, we, we are happy, that it makes people happy. And um, she understood that. She understood that sharing things a lot of times can build bridges in other ways too. So for many years, she believed strongly in working with people like Gaylord with um, different museums. And she would approach them and say, I have some belts that I made that I'm not using right now. These that you have on display that do have dubious origin, were they taken out of ones that maybe we thought were taken out of a grave? What if we trade? What if I gift you with that? What the ones I have in my trunk right now that I'm not using, and you're more than welcome to have, and then we'll take that one out. And um, many museums took her up on that. So that way there was a... That's kind of why he offered that. That's, and I think a lot of tribes have done that. Um, they'll make something that's a little bit different, kind of a placeholder. Maybe it's more of a, um, it's less complex than the original one. In order to get the original thing back, they're not trying to create fakes or forgeries or anything like that. The goal is to get those um, culturally sensitive items out of there. So um, it's not something that we do as a custom. We're doing it out of necessity. So if there is a creation of something intended to be put in the place of something, it's, it's because in our perspective, it probably shouldn't have been taken in the first place. But we're trying to fix something. So you have to come up with new ideas and new approaches. And my grandmother made a lot of friends. I can go into museums and, and I told her now, don't you try to get my grandma's belt back she they, they that's theirs and they do have a bill of sale and um what a great thing to share with the world because you don't really get to see that type of craftsmanship especially for a woman who is diabetic insulin dependent ever since she was in her 40s plus i don't know if gaylord knows she was she was profoundly colorblind as a as for a woman that is very rare and so yeah, so when she's talking about colors, she's going by the ones in, in her head. A lot of times, you'll I'll walk into a museum and there'll be a yarn belt in there looking kind of crazy. It's got like like pale blue and salmon and a, and a brown and a bright yellow. You know, I'm like, wow, that's something. Because she was looking at her con the contrast primarily and she was she was very colorblind and so what would happen is she would take some of the grandkids with her to the store and she would say pick out a pretty color gouache and so they would and they would gravitate toward these really 
really razzly dazzly colors. Today, all of her, if she was still alive, her yarn belts would be like neon green and glitter. You know, glitter is real big. Some unicorn colors, I'm sure, is what she'd be making. So, um, one of the things that she felt strongly in is that um, things that she made, she was glad it made people happy. And she would go talk. I think the Smithsonian um, came and have her uh, had her talk and speak about um, things that she had made. And, and for her, it was more about connecting with how she learned it, her family, um, teaching it to my sisters, not me. I'm horrible at it. Um, she says, you talk good. Don't, don't do, try to do the yarn belt thing. She, You're good at talking. That's good. And making fire. I can make fire really good, but not, not this stuff. I have to buy mine or be nice to people who know how to make it. So um, there are those people in different Native communities um, going through a hard time. They didn't have a museum. They didn't have resources. Um, they didn't know where they would be, um, the, even as late as the Indian Relocation Program, where the design of that policy was to empty out reservations. Um, a lot of people made desperate decisions and they thought, well, no one's going to be left here in the reservation. We're turning the lights out when we go. So we're going to go to the local, local county historian or these families that we've known for hundreds of years that have always been our neighbors and we're going to trust them with them. So sometimes things got moved in that way and you just had to pray and hope that someday they'll come back. And if they don't, you know, that they remember. And um, I think that's something that's really important. We're not talking about art as theft. It's great. We, we enjoy when people can appreciate the beauty. These are, these are in many ways extraordinarily beautiful things. And it would be a shame if they weren't seen as integral, part, integral parts of our world from a functional perspective, but also from a spiritual perspective. And sometimes they just look great and it would be a shame to have them you know that nobody sees thank you so much that was amazing um and i think now we're going to eat <laughs>